This is Lisa, and this is Wendy. Hi, everyone. We have had a big honor that over the last years been interviewing The Revolution, the legendary band that played next to Prince. A band that for sure knows how it is to be on the mountaintop, with millions of records selling and played in front of hundreds of thousands and countless of awards. On behalf of Prince and The Revolution, we would like to thank you for believing and sharing with us uh, what we've been able to create for everybody on vinyl. Um, we'd also like to tell you that we believe in the spirit and we thank you for believing too. Thank you for this award. So what could I do to break the ice once I have the opportunity to sit with them? What could surprise them? Is there something I could say that could make an impression? Because these artists obviously have seen a lot. Well, I could maybe show them a few odd records. Wow, you got man. That's a record. That's the B-side. Ronnie Tucker Brush. This is rare. Very rare. Very rare. This is very rare. Sure you want me to sign it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Alright, that makes it pretty good. You can everybody sign this. They're covered. Let's work and Ronnie talk to Russia. That's incredible. I've never seen that before. <laughs> That, my friends, was of course only a small sample. We have tons of material. That's what happened? <laughs> yeah. What? Tell me more! Yeah, we did some stuff, but he was, you know, towards the end of his life, he was getting more... Uh, the sky insular was a little bit more of a problem. Yeah, we do that before the main show that evening. He, he had the presidential suites in the hotel, and he would never sleep in that bed. The Star of Purple Rain. Oh my Please God! Please welcome oh, Prince. His Royal Badness, Prince. Up this way, Prince. Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! Oh, God. oh Prince! 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 I love you, Prince. First out in our never-ending crusade through the history of funk and soul, and the revolution in particular, is Matt Fink, aka Dr. Fink. He's actually the only band member who have been working with Prince through the whole 80s, from Dirty Mind up until the new tour in Graffiti Bridge. Yeah, so we're going to hear a lot of stories from that period and get to know Matt Fink, Dr. Fink, a little bit more. Enjoy. You're nasty. Say it. On the keyboard, Dr. Fink. We're glad to have you on board as a guest Thank here. Um, okay. So uh, it's a big an honor. And we, we're going to try to do some topics about the the background. Uh, for many of us, it's it's obvious and we know the story. But for some of the viewers who are not that familiar, 
uh, a very short summary could be that you you're you're actually the, yes, the only one who's been in the Prince Band since Dirty Mind up until the new tour for, for a long time. So, so uh, that puts you in a very unique position. But before we go into that, we would like to be as the, uh, if there is a elevator pitch on how, how it all started up for you, how your interest in music and uh, where did, did the journey begun and how did it oh. end up in the revolution? Okay, uh, well, I'll start from the very beginning as best I can. Uh, my parents, who are both uh, had degrees in theater and musical theater and regular theater, and, and my father, he dabbled in the little piano, but he wasn't really a, a, a um, never had lessons. He just liked to play, you know, and make up okay. his own stuff. And then my mom had a little bit of piano lessons growing up and could play a little classical, things like that. So. But they were their main focus uh, was the theater and doing professional voiceover work and all through my childhood. And they did a lot of plays together. My dad directed them plays. He, he acted in them. He wrote a play that won an award, actually. So there was so a I, creative, creative component very from, creative. from early on. Yeah. yeah, my parents were very artistic, and so they they actually got me into theater and music very young you know by the time i was about eight i was already acting in some plays and doing some uh actual educational recordings for this one company that that they brought me in to do some stuff for when i was a kid and um and then piano lessons started like about when i was about seven ish Main, mainly the simple, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, yeah. you know, and then, and then we, moving we, on, like, moving we on. Have, to, we have all been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then, and then yeah. moving on to classical, and then, and then when I was about 14, I, I said to my dad and my mom, I said, you know, I really want to learn more about pop and jazz music, you know, instead of just playing classical. I want, I want to be able to improvise. And at that time, I was already playing in my first band. I, I had, we had a, our neighborhood kids that I grew up with, we created our own group when we were about 12 oh. and did our first gig when we were just shy of about 13 years old at that time. Most of us were about not quite 13 and, and we, we played at some girl's uh, party, private party That's for her birthday. That was the first first gig. <laughs> Someone our age. Oh. And, um, and then from there that group we started to book ourselves to do junior high school dances because mm -hmm. because we were in junior high at the time so we, we would go to all the different schools in our community and, and promote ourselves and say hey we we'd like to you know be the band playing live at your at your show at your i'm sorry party you know the or the dance school dances at night they they would have those you know so, so we, the, the rumor spread that these are the acts to hire yeah, for those occasions. Exactly. We were yeah. already at that age. We were, we were out trying to play. And then, you know, by the time we were in, a, in high school together, that same group, same people, uh, we competed in some battle of the bands and we won because mm. we, we started so young and we were we were doing stuff. We weren't playing originals yet, but we were a cover band. And then, you know, by the time I was uh, in my senior year, I left that group to join another group with some older guys okay. to tour around the, the, the five state area of Minnesota because you've got Minnesota and Wisconsin and North South Dakota, Iowa, mm. Nebraska, those areas. And we, we were touring around there. So, so about three months before I finished my senior year, I was already out playing. And, you know, and I, with th those guys and the other band, I, I left them behind. And then, uh, and then the drummer from that band, I brought him in to this group I had joined about about six months later. And then he came in and he was there for about a, not even a year. And then he got an offer to be in a, a group that was very well known and had a record deal with RCA Records. And then he toured with them and did all that for a minute. But he didn't stay with it maybe two years tops with that. So you, you, uh, you gained a lot of experience from those gigs and a rotation of yeah. different musicians, it sounds like. Right, right. And, well, and then, you know, I, I, I changed groups as well. Uh, after that, that one that I joined in my senior year of high school, I was with them a little over a year or so. And then I had an off from another band that I liked even more because they were doing a lot of R&B pop and Steely Dan and 
Uh, and then we, we were also doing all the music that was big from the disco era at that time. But, you know, the previous group was more of a pop rock thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we were playing a lot of... And now you adapted the disco uh, movement. Yeah, we got yeah. we got more into the R and B and side of things than than just like you know playing the Rolling Stones in Boston and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we got into into that. So fast forward a little more. I'm about I'm 20 years old, and Bobby Z, who I knew really well growing up, uh, because his parents and my parents knew each other. We we grew up in the same suburb of Minneapolis, which was St. Louis Park, and uh, our parents used to do these uh, occasional fundraising events for one of the local hospitals. Okay. And I remember one time my dad and Bobby Z's dad emceed that show and my mom and Bobby's mom did a skit, mm -hmm. a couple funny skits, you know, for performance skits for comedy. Anyway, uh, so so Bobby and I were in touch, not a lot, but because he was a couple years older than me, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't we didn't really run in the same circles that much, but we knew each other. And then he was kind of keeping an eye on me at that time as a keyboard player because he was already starting to work with Prince at, wow. at, at that so time. So he had noticed your, your talent. Uh, yeah, yeah. He definitely the, yeah. Knew, knew that I was a capable player. And uh, one evening he came out to a uh, nightclub I was playing at. This was in 1977. And he said, hey, I want you to come out to my car on your break and listen to this cassette of this demo from this artist that I've been working with and I'm helping and is being managed by Owen Husney, who I'm like, he was an intern for Owen at that time, like a yeah. runner for Owen. So I said, okay. So I went out to the car. He, he played me the tape. And of course I was extremely impressed with it, the sound of it. And I said, wow, this is amazing. Who's the band? <laughs> and he said, it's not a band. It's one guy, one kid in the studio by himself, playing all the instruments, writing, producing, singing, everything. And I just went, what? <laughs> I said, you gotta be kidding me. And he goes, and he's your age. You guys are the same age. In fact, you're, I think you're maybe a couple months old, older than Prince, he said. And I go, Prince? His name is Prince? He goes, yep. His name, is that his real name? <laughs> I go, wow, I've never met anybody named Prince for a first name. Are you sure that's his real name? That's not a made up name. It sounds you made know, up. <laughs> that's got to be his stage name, Bobby. Yeah. He goes, no, that's the name that his parents gave him. And his full name is Prince Rogers Nelson. And, and his father had his own jazz ensemble called the Prince Rogers Trio. And that's why it was named after his father. So, uh, but it's John Nelson is his father's real name. So, but that was a stage name mm. for his father that he gave to Prince. <laughs> so go so figure. It, right? it was for real. You, you it got was for real name. though, totally for real. <laughs> so I just said to Bobby at that time, I said, you know, why don't you, you know, keep me in the loop? And Bobby was saying, well, yeah, we're, we're Prince's manager is going to attempt to get him a record deal and we're going to be he's going to be shopping with other agents out to the major labels in new york and la and hopefully they'll get something for this guy and i go cool well let me know when he wants to put a band together because i'd love to meet him i'd love to be a part of this if possible obviously you brought it to me to listen to so i would maybe be on board right yeah. he goes yeah that's part of it so he, he got your attention there and you, yeah, you but became curious, of course. <laughs> but I can't guarantee you'll get hired, he said, but, you know, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to audition someday. So. We're gonna walk
fast forward to October of 1978. This was like late 77 when mm. I heard this demo. And then fast forward, he, he gets signed to Warner Brothers. He does the first album. I buy the first album. Mm. Even before I know I can get an audition with this guy, because I, I he, he, A, he's the only artist in Minneapolis at the time that had a major label record deal. And, and someone who's really young, very unique, plays yeah. all the instruments, does his own production, blah, blah, blah. So it was, it was, so, only, it could only be Prince. <laughs> yeah, it could only yeah. be. Yeah, so I get the record, I, I put it on the turntable, I bring it home and listen to it, and I'm just like floored because that opening, uh, excuse me, that opening thing where, where he. Um, the, the, the track for you. Yeah, the for you a cappella thing just blew yeah. me away, you know, it just blew me away. I was like, what is this? I've never heard anything like this. It's such a, a odd and amazing opening. It's just like, yeah. And who, absolutely, who does that? <laughs> it's a, it was genius. It was brilliant. It was like nothing. I'd, it was like angels singing from heaven. You know, so I, I just said, oh, my God, who is this guy? This is not normal. This is not your average artist. That's especially at that age, other than maybe Stevie Wonder yeah. or another idol of mine, Todd Rundgren, who I actually had met at that time too through, through a friend of mine. But uh, I'm still a huge fan of, of Todd's, obviously. Yeah, so, Stevie Wonder. What was the obvious reference from? Obvious early reference. On? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but people who do it all in the studio, play all the instruments, and yeah. all that. So. So that was it. So then I started bugging Bobby again. <laughs> when, are you, when, when are you opening up auditions? Well, we've already started looking at some people, you know, we da da da. And they want this one keyboard player, but we don't know if he's on board yet. And I go, oh, so I'm not going to get a shot at this. Emma. He goes, well, not at the moment, but we'll, we'll let you know. Mm. And then, oh, maybe a couple months later, I, I heard through the grapevine that the keyboard player that they wanted decided uh, to do something else with some other people. He was never fully on board because he's he's also that gentleman who's a friend of mine still to this day. <laughs> he, um, I won't name names, but he, he uh, went on to be a, ma a major player too, you know, in the industry. So, um, oh, I might as well name him. Ricky Peterson, <laughs> great friend of mine. Ricky Peterson, Peter, yeah. His older brother, you knew that. So, yeah. you know, the thing is, is that, that these guys are just massively talented. Then I, the door opened again for auditions for keyboard players. So they started auditioning a bunch of people besides me. I, I think I was up against about seven or eight other keyboard players that they looked at, mm. at least. And um, including Yanni, of all people. You remember Yanni? Yanni, yeah. You ever heard of Yanni, the New Age yeah. artist from Minneapolis originally? Remember him? Uh, I've heard his name, yeah. Okay, okay. So look him up sometime. Mm. So anyway... Uh, I had my shot. This was October of 78. And uh, so Prince decided to bring me in. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into the group.
there, there was a, a shift for the, the Dirty Mind era, of course. That's when, uh, as we mentioned, the For You album is an amazing album, and so is the Prince album. But I think the most of the industry musicians agree upon that the Dirty Mind was kind of a starting point. And, uh, and uh, so could you, the, the, the shift from, uh, let's say, the two first two albums to the Dirty Mind uh, vibe, uh, was it something that was Prince's own process or did he um, talk to you guys about it or uh, strictly his his own process really when you think about it mm. strictly his own process so, no it's all right was there any f- from from when you came into the band was there a, any uh, particular time when he started to involve you more and more and ask you questions or ask of your input or or did he just like tell you what to do for a long time or when did it change that you got more and more involved i understand that you well yeah for for, for that album the first two albums he did all by himself and we just had to learn the songs and play them as like side men you know so so it's basically being in a glorified cover band for a major label artist really you're not really contributing to the writing at that point now uh you know of course he loved to jam before every rehearsal and warm up and one day we were jamming and i came up with this chord progression that he liked and it, and he said hey i, I want to do something with that so he had me come over that evening to his house after rehearsal and that became the song dirty mind so hmm. that's how things would work out for me anytime i had a co-write with him it was usually because of a jam session it was never presenting a fully finished song with lyrics and melody because he didn't want your lyrics or melody he, he strictly wanted to do his own messaging in his mm. lyrics and had his own vision so i don't know if he ever accepted anybody else's outside lyrics as far as i know except for maybe when he was producing the time i think he he had a song from des dickerson that went on there so then it's true uh, then uh, what you see in the purple rain movie a little bit that yeah when they, they did the, the sort of the purple rain thing that he didn't really like when when uh, people wanted to stuff uh, lyrics or, or melodies in his face so to say exactly so so that's how that worked out and then uh and then he brought me in again to play on the song head and i did the solo on the song head synthesizer solo i was just going to mention head because that's the that's the iconic solo that is attached to you forever uh, matt yeah because yeah. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. i just to give you some perspective on that here in sweden scandinavia in the late 80s when i was trying to learn piano basic guitar went to music school it's like yeah we you want to play the bass like uh, Larry Graham of course and and you want to do that uh, Dr. Fink solo like head you want to play like Dr. Fink in head the solo so it was like uh, it's a kind of yeah just to give you a perspective that uh, that solo has meant so much for so many that's put in some kind of standard uh, so it's a uh, uh, it's a trademark you you have to live with <laughs> but I guess that's okay I guess it's okay. Yeah, I, I, that's nice to know. Okay. I wrote that down too, actually, right here. Head. My question is: Did you just make that up, or did Prince write it, or did you write it, or is it, it you playing? Yes, just playing, or that's all me improvising in the studio. I must have done probably seven takes or so of this, maybe a little more. We, you know, I kept doing more than one, but he was he was just saying, well keep doing what you're doing and I'll just we'll just keep running it till we get one that's tight tightest sounding mm-hmm. and and then I was developing it as I went and each take to take I would kind of try to remember what was working what, what mistakes were made and then you know building on it till we got it right and he was punching me in so to speak so I'd get like half the solo done and he said okay I'm I'm gonna have you continue here and take it out to the end and we'll punch you in right at that moment so play along blah 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 because back then it was all yeah. you know, analog tape and everything. But go ahead, what? Yeah, no, no, I was just wondering after that, then after Dirty Mind, the albums I have, I guess you see in my wall on behind me there. Yeah. So all of the albums, controversy, and then on up till let's say around the world in a day. What of which of those albums did you, so to say, get more and more input in to do things that you like to do, or or which album did you have the most fun creating with him or play with him or whatever we should say? Well. Purple Rain was the one that where the, the revolution did quite a bit of work on, you know, like as far as live, the live sessions of, of what you hear on half of that record. Um, 
you know, we like again we were jamming one day and I, I had some like bass thing going on and we were just jamming and then he said, Hey, I like that, we'll put that in computer blue. <laughs> or or that, that became computer blue. But that, that song was like several writers on that. You know, it was like uh, Prince myself, Lisa Wendy and Prince's dad had a had a hand in the bridge section of that song. <laughs> I mean, I played on certain songs on each record. You know, there's usually one or two, not a lot. He didn't really need us in the studio a ton, you know, to, to be at his side. And then occasionally I would, uh, he would hear something, like I said, during a jam and he'd say, hey, I like that. And then he would use it to write a song around. So that happened occasionally, not a lot though. You know. But then you were doing it live then on all the shows. Yeah, exactly. And then Lisa and Wendy, you know, I'd say by around Around the World in the Day album, Lisa and Wendy and Wendy, uh, Lisa's brother, David Coleman, was brought in to do some work on Around the World in the Day. I think he, I think David actually wrote the music to Around the World in the Day. I'm not sure if it was lyrics that he contributed to. I can't remember for sure. Yeah, it's, it's something with the title oh. track, yeah. Mm. Does he, does, is he credited with lyrics on that too? Uh, I'm not sure if it's lyrics or the musical, but he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, has a strong input on the title track, yeah, okay. in some way. Yeah, yeah. He, well, yeah, there was the music side of it was a lot of him on that one. But you, you mentioned the, the uh, warm-ups and the check, uh, sound checks and jams, and they're circulating a lot of recordings from those kind of sound checks in which ended up with being enormous jams and kind of yeah. a source for inspiration and developing of songs uh, i guess yeah so uh, th that was but must be a, that was a part of a, the creative process in which you were involved because he, he he like took small pieces from everywhere during those uh, long jam sessions i guess yeah that's right he did there were, but you know uh, he usually um I would usually know if something if he was using something to give writing credit for. He he didn't, you know. Some people were who worked with him felt there, that he may have been taking ideas and not giving full credit where credit was due. But I never encountered that with him ever. So because um, it was pretty infrequent, you know, really that he needed to grab something from somebody else. I know that he used Lisa in the studio a lot for background vocals and. I think Wendy at some point, Wendy and Lisa were doing things, you know, like Around the World in the Day Parade, those two albums in particular, Wendy and Lisa were utilized more than anybody else. How was the rehearsals for the last, uh, let's say, 1999, uh, Purple Rain and Around the World in a Day and so on? Was it, was it like he just called you in the middle of the night? As you, you, you hear a lot of stories about how much you had to rehearse and he liked to jam and play, as you said. Was um, it difficult he, or he never, he never did that. Rehearsals were structured during the day, usually. Um, I, I like to go early because I would need the extra time ahead of everybody to work out sounds or find the right stuff or, or just 
keep like learning parts or to just go over stuff so I'd be prepared because you know there were a few times when I'd be come to rehearsal and I wouldn't be prepared and he'd be really upset about that you know so I wanted to make sure I was ready to go and uh, so as far as calling in the middle of the night for rehearsal didn't happen very much didn't happen much at all um, it, it, it was always scheduled during the day. It, it would start around 11 in the morning-ish when he'd show up, maybe noon. <laughs> I'd be there by 10, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., depending on when start time was, you know, scheduled. And then we could rehearse anywhere from, you know, be done by 5, or sometimes we'd be done by 8. And then he would, after that, he would probably take a dinner break and go right into the studio and work all night maybe get four hours of sleep and start over with us the next day. So, and if you got called into the studio, then you you were called in to do the all-nighter with them. We heard a lot of stories about these work ethics of his, and uh, you describe it yourself as very scheduled, and he's doing that. And but we also hear stories about that he had a um, big, good sense of humor, and he was a practical joker. And so every, every, every one who worked with him, yeah, he, he could be very strict, and he could have his sides. But he also was kind of a very funny guy that we maybe not often could see on shows and movies and stuff like that. But uh, it, we hear those stories. It would be very interesting to hear, like, yeah, the funny guy behind uh, Enigma uh, pers- per- persona. <laughs> uh, sure. how, how was how was he as a humorous guy? Yeah, he he's a pretty funny guy. He actually had a um, a practical joke that he came up with to play on uh, one of the local music critic journalists here, a guy named John okay. Bream good friend of mine good, he was good friends with Prince too he was always very good to Prince in, in his reviews for the most part but uh, so so this is the 1999 tour we're playing Minneapolis and he's John Bream is scheduled to come backstage and interview some of the band members so Bobby Z and Des Dickerson were there I was there and Prince said okay guys I want Bobby to walk in or no I think Prince was that's right Prince was doing the interview my bad Prince was being interviewed in the dressing room and then he wanted Bobby to come in and then Des to come in but Bobby first to come in and go over to the table where all the food was and you know pretend or act like he's making a sandwich and then get mad because they forgot to bring the mayo and the ketchup (laughs) and the mustard they didn't have any condiments on the table so so (laughs) They're sitting on a couch and behind them is this table laid out with deli meats and the usual thing. And Bobby starts to make a sandwich. He goes, what the fuck? What is wrong here? There's no ketchup. Where's the fucking ketchup? You know, and he's like going off. He gets mad and he's like pacing around the room behind Prince and he's yelling out the door to somebody to come and bring condiments. And then he goes back to the table and he picks the table up and throws it up in the air and tosses everything off the table in front of John Bream and Prince. 
and John, and John the, expression. <laughs> yeah, the expression, and, and and this was all being videoed, right? So it was meant to be a total joke. And then Des comes in and goes, "What happened to the food? I was gonna have a sandwich, Bobby. How dare you!" And then he like starts pushing Bobby around. <laughs> you know, it just it got out of hand. Wow. And then and then finally, you know, they they started laughing and. John realized it was a But at the Love Sexy show in Stockholm, there were two shows. I remember one particular night we had tickets really close to that cross stage thing. And I think you and some other guys, but I know it was you, you threw Snickers bars at us and maybe some oranges. I don't know if you remember exactly what it was, but I know it was <laughs> candy bars. And we were like, how, how is th this is so cool. The, Matt Fink, everybody, the, the, whoever it was, was throwing candy bars at us. Was that a Prince idea or just yeah. you or how that did that come Prince about? Idea. Prince idea. Yeah. He had, he had me do that at every show to go out front and hand candy bars and fruit out to the audience. <laughs> yeah. That was so funny. I remember because I got a Snickers bar on me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and so, yeah, the, the other food fight happened at the end of 90, 1999. It was this, there were, there were, it started the second to the last show and then continued into the next show, the next night, the final show in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were in another city the previous night, which I don't remember, might've been Cleveland. I don't know for sure. But all I know is that, that uh, Morris Day and, and Jesse Johnson came down to our dressing room because these dressing rooms were like stacked up and different floors and then there were stairs that you could take between the, the dressing room so they they walked down and they started joking around and doing something and bobby threw a piece of fruit at him just to mess with him and and then it escalated into throwing fruit and at each other and they kept coming back with fruit to throw at bobby and so forth so that started and then and then it it, it just kind of kept escalating that evening and then and then the people in the time thought it would be a good idea to go to our hotel rooms and put mustard all over our doorknobs <laughs> uh, amongst other things after that that evening because you know we were messing with them they were messing with us and then the following evening the food fight continued backstage and uh and then our management team went out and bought i don't know how many maybe 50 or more cream pies and had them brought in at the after the end of the show and we had payback a, time we, we yeah. had a big pie fight yeah. in the dressing room with everybody fortunately it was a hockey arena so you're in, you're in a big hockey locker room with you know concrete floors everything was concrete so the, the guys from the time they were provoking you and uh <laughs> yeah we were provoking each other it was one of those things we, we had a conversation with jelvin johnson a, a while ago and and uh, Oh, yeah. he, he described uh, one of the tours that you did together with uh, Sap and Rogers, and uh, that was that tour. That was that tour, yeah. Because he Roger said that the, the management and the Rogers and it, they were kind of some of them were annoyed at the, the fact that the, the the time guys were members were quite a cocky and uh, annoying, and uh, I guess this yes. explains it. <laughs> and they they were annoyed when the food fight happened during like during the show. There was food being tossed at us. <laughs> By the time, and, and at one point, Prince had Jerome Benton pulled off stage, and and they poured honey all over him and cereal, and, oh and then God. back on stage, they, they, Prince had Chick, his bodyguard, grab him off stage, and they tarred and feathered him, so to speak. No way! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! It was something else. It was really, really intense. So it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they were mad, and and then. Was, Roger and, and his group, like, I'll never forget, I said goodbye to Roger at the end of the night, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd been in his dressing room earlier saying, hi, how are you, blah, 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 Good. it was fun touring with you and so forth. And he looked at me at the end of the night 
after all the shenanigans and he goes grown men yeah exactly grown yeah. men <laughs> just like that I know that we we are maybe soon running out of time here, Matt. But I, I li- like to ask you. There's a few questions. Uh, one of them is the the, the after shows that that start to develop. Uh, yeah. And especially in uh, when we talked to Eric Leeds uh, also a while ago, he said that the most amazing ones were the ones in in Europe, and and, and there were a lot of. Uh, Yeah, some of things were of course rehearsed, but there was a lot of improvisation, and, and it started to develop to be a concept of its own. And it's a lot of iconic after-show gigs. And uh, could you give us some take on that and the development of those gigs? And uh, I guess there were different kind of guests, and there were late-night gigs that were totally improvised and stuff like that. Uh, how was yeah. the vibe? How was the the vibe? Was we're gonna go jam. And we're going to wing it. And here, let's rehearse a few songs that we'll play. And I, I remember Prince liked to play the song "Just Your Imagination," which you yeah, the Temptation favorite. one, yeah, Temptation song. So that was one of the covers he wanted to do. So we we did work that out. We worked out certain songs, and then rough. I mean, rough versions. I mean, we never really had arrangements. We didn't really work on them that hard for very long. So um, those were in place, and then. Um, That's just what he wanted to do. He he just liked to play. So much so you're just along for the ride really you're mm-hmm. just going with his whims at that point so you know i was all good with that mm-hmm. i i had fun it was a lot of fun and and we got to meet and perform with a lot of fun uh singers and artists that come up and jam and um some pretty big name people i mean i'm never forget in london we had one night where nile rogers eric clapton and ron wood from the stones came up and played with us and george michael was in the audience hmm. watching this wow i actually sat down with george before the set before hmm. like a good hour he george showed up before anybody he just was hanging out at the bar nobody hardly anybody was in the club hmm. and i walked up to george and i just said hi buddy how you doing nice to meet you and i sat down and had a conversation with him. for me that was everything hmm. to be able to meet people i looked up to like that um at one point i'll never forget uh, we had an after show party also in in london and um i'm just sitting at a table with uh my future wife who i'm married to now with we were she was with me at that time congratulations thank you and, and we were sitting there and up walks mick jagger and jerry hall his wife at the time mm. he said hey can i sit down with you and i said sure <laughs> you know now i'd met okay. mick 
I met Mick back in 1981 when we opened for the Stones. I'm sure you've heard that story yeah. and know that, <laughs> how, how that went down. Many people know that story about how Prince was booed and things were thrown at us and everything. Yeah. So, so, so we've you're fast forwarding here to I think this was actually this was the nude tour of uh, summer of 1990. Mm. Yeah. And that was the last tour I did with Prince. And and there, that's there's Mick Jagger coming up to sit down and have a drink with me, impromptu. Wait, we're all waiting for Prince to show up to, to hang out. This was more of just a just a hangout party. It wasn't yeah. really a performance after party. Just an after show party. So listen, um, we're. We're still in rehearsal, so you're invited to a rehearsal tonight, okay? We're just gonna play some new things and try out on you and try out on ourselves. And that's an old friend, Dr. Fink. This is a new, a new friend in polka dot suit. Lana Bliss on the trumpet. Mr. Madhouse Eric Leeds on the saxophone. And Sheila E on the drums. Thank you, good night. She told me to say that. And for those of you on Valium, my name is Prince. the opportunity to really have a nice conversation with the likes of Mick Jagger mm. so for me that that means everything yeah. you know to, to have been uh, around Prince work for Prince have the opportunity and and be able to uh, meet some of the iconic rock heroes that I grew up with you mm. know because those guys are old, you know they're older than us you know, when I was when I was about six or seven, the Stones were just starting out. You know, yeah, on Ed Sullivan and the Beatles and all that. I, I, I saw the Beatles' first performance on Ed Sullivan when I was just turned six years old. Wow! Mm -hmm. And and it was highly influential for me. Mm. And they're still going on. <laughs> Who knows what they will do next, right? Exactly. And and that I have to say that the British invasion of the '60s was one of the most influential things that um, ever happened to the music industry and to, to inspire young people like myself at the time. Mm. So that that's one of the main things. And then of course the Motown thing got me too. I mean, yeah, I course. watched yeah. the Supremes and Stevie Wonder and James Brown. I was influenced by all of it. I loved mm. all aspects of artistry coming from those camps, you know, and so Wow. You, you mentioned that the new tour then was the last tour with him and some year before that the, the Love Sexy tour ended and I'm kind of curious about the shift 
because there there is a there is a period of from you can say dirty mind to love sexy where each album was very he has have done extremely good work afterward and before of course but i I guess we could agree that the peak is those eight years in some aspect. Uh, from but what, what what happened in the with the shift from the love sexy to the Batman? He changed the, the band. He, uh, he was he was I guess he was uh, wasn't given those uh, sales from the states that he wanted for the album. I guess some show some of uh, shops didn't want to front it, have it behind the desk, and there was a. And the, the shows weren't that sold out as much as in Europe in the States. There was a lot of, yeah, it wasn't going his way all the way. Well, so how did he react? And was that a component in which he changed the band and went into Batman? Why did he choose Batman? Yeah, there's a lot well, of questions there. <laughs> well, the, the, the issue is I, I never was privy to his business mind and what was going on in there. I was just a hired gun to be the keyboard guy and play the songs i didn't have to think about the business side he never shared what was going on in his mind um so there was really no interaction in that way it was just like matt i respect you as a player you're you're my guy uh here's the cassette or the cd go learn the songs the ones you didn't play on and be ready for to tour and that was that was my job so yeah. i didn't really know because i i didn't I, i mean i would see things happening mm. out of the corner of my eye or i would see what changes were taking place but i never knew why so i'm afraid i can't shed much light on it yeah how was it then for you after i was at the new tour in the globe arena in stockholm 1990 and uh, and and after that you say you weren't a part of the band anymore but did you have a relation ship with prince as a friend after that did he did you meet him sometimes did he ask you to yes. play at yeah. any form or yeah how yeah. was that period right yeah, after he, he was disappointed though with me uh one night i didn't really intend to leave at the time at the end of 1990 he he, he had a short notice gig came up you know and hindsight is always 2020 if i if, if i could do it all over again i probably would have not have said no to going to that at this point but Um, it was one of those things where I had an opportunity. I was working on a project in the studio. I just got underway. Prince had was not keeping me on retainer at that point. He like the year before, kind of like the, my contract was up. He didn't renew anything and say, "Oh, here's a salary while we're not touring." And I just needed to, you know, not that I didn't have enough money to survive, but I wanted to keep cash flow coming of working i want i wanted to learn how to be a music producer myself because i hadn't had much experience on that side of the coin other than just being a session player for other people or you know what i mean or writing some stuff but i i, I wasn't an in, a studio engineer yet i wanted to learn that side i wanted to learn how to be a producer engineer and this was an opportunity for me to do that on this project and i had gotten underway i'd signed a contract with this company and then i get a phone call from not prince personally but from his uh secretary asking me to be ready to rehearse for some show in rio de janeiro rock and rio and i said okay well i'm, I'm i'd love to do it but i just started a project i signed a contract i got if i get out of it you know i talked to the people i said if like if i say no at this point they're going to give it the project to somebody else mm -hmm. and then Believe me, I wrestled with the decision. It was really mm. difficult, and yeah. and then I said to Prince, I said, "Look, I, I, I made a decision to do this project. Can you maybe get someone to fill in for me?" But I didn't say that to his face. It went through his secretary, so she told him what I said, and then he immediately took that as, "Well, he's not loyal anymore," and da da da. So they went and got Tommy Elm or Barbarella, and 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 he filled in for me, and then instead of just having him fill in. He kept him on board mm. and that was the end of my job so you know we all make those kinds of mistakes i suppose yeah. in our careers uh but i don't know if i view it as a total mistake because then it opened the doors for other things for me to do after that but you got to tell him later that you you didn't uh so to say i didn't, I, I didn't intentionally quit no i no, exactly yeah, yeah. and i didn't mean to and he, he understood And we stayed friends, and then we saw each other from time to time after that. So yeah, there there, there was no bitterness or anything at all. Let's 
conversation you had with him do you remember that yeah the last conversation was uh september of 2014 um i went out to paisley park he invited me out to have a meeting and he he the first thing out of his mouth was hey i've been thinking about reuniting the revolution he brought bobby z out to to that meeting and he told both of us that he he was starting to think about it and what do you would you guys be into doing that again Wow. And and we just went, hell yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> wow, what are you waiting for? You know, we've been waiting for you to do that for years. Yeah, sure. And, and I said, have you told anybody else in the band what you're thinking? He goes, no, I I just wanted to talk to you guys first, and then I'm gonna communicate with the other people. Well, mm. for whatever reason, after that meeting, he he never pursued it in a serious way. He just put together Third Eye Girl. And I thought, okay, he's got to get that out of his system. Hopefully, he'll still do a revolution thing at some mm. point. And then, you know, the rest is history. So, yeah, uh, it didn't come to fruition. Um, he also wanted to talk to Bobby and I about some other things that he was concerned about, but I won't go. Through mm. that. Of course, you had your own band. Uh, uh, we talked uh, years ago. Well, and my own band. Yeah, that that was one of the things he wanted to talk to me about, but. He wasn't too pleased with the Purple Experience, which was a, a basically a Prince tribute act. Okay. That I was asked to to join by some other people who I'd done a show with uh, earlier, and they came to me with the idea. At first, I said no. I said Prince would never approve of me playing in and playing myself in a Prince tribute <laughs> band. Okay. And then, uh, and I'm not going to blame my wife, but my wife said, "Hey, you should do it anyway, um, because a it'll be good for us financially." And maybe it'll show Prince that you're still interested in playing, and then it'll cajole him into reuniting with the revolution. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of why I did it. So I started doing it in early 2012, and that mm -hmm. meeting in 2014 was about him saying, "Hey, I want to do the revolution, but at the same time, I don't want you to do the Purple Experience kind of thing." So your I wife think. had right, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> like persuade it kind of showed prince something and he, he he was actually started to make him think twice about it and i said well look you know um we're just promoting the brand people thank me after every show and say i'm so glad you came to poughkeepsie mm. wherever the you know some smaller city because we never got to see prince he doesn't come to this market or we, we couldn't afford his tickets or you know, you brought the music, we love it. Regardless, even though I saw Prince, I love coming to hear Prince music in any way, shape or form. And if it's brought by Dr. Fink, mm. then great, you know. So I just said to Prince at that, in the meeting, I said, look, we're just promoting your brand. You know, people are going out and buying our music again too. Mm. And then he got it. He went, okay, okay, I get it. Mm. And you think you could ask your lead singer not to dress up in my outfits though? <laughs> yeah. And I went, Oh well, it is a tribute band, Prince. I, I, you know, it's just an act. It's just a, a thing. This is what's in now. Tribute mm -hmm. bands are in right now. Granted, I know it's probably not in the best taste for me to be out there as Dr. Fink doing it, but um, the fans love it. Mm -hmm. And then you had to drop them to go back to the revolution. What's that? You had to drop that uh, Purple Experience band later to go yeah, in. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any problem with that. I no, you, you can't do both. You can't. No, do exactly. Both. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, I left the Purple Experience to reunite with the Revolution and do some touring with them. Obviously, after Prince passed. So, um, 
Yeah, it, it's but you know it's funny. Some people were really offended by me doing that, and others didn't care. Hmm. You know, they thought it was not a big deal. So it just depends on your perspective. <laughs> the purple experience and the, now the revolution but i guess you got a lot of assignments and the requests and stuff like that but what different kind of uh, assignments and or side project have you been involved in okay since? well there, there's an artist by the name of michelle rose if any, anybody wants to check her out it, her name, it, she has her own youtube channel called michelle rose music i've been working with her for about three years uh, writing and producing her material She's very young. She's in music school. She's finally going to graduate this year uh, from the Berklee School of Music of Boston, which is a very renowned music school. She's majoring in vocals and production and stuff. So I'm continuing with her right now. Um, she's continuing to grow as an artist. Um, I, I continue to do session work for other people when it comes in. But my main function for the last five years has been working for a newer company here in Minneapolis called V Media Entertainment. Mm. And the, the parent company, which is called ADX Labs, is where I started first before it became V Media. And they, I helped them develop a music streaming service, which is uh, called My My Music, which mm. is dedicated to independent hip hop and R&B artists right now. Carousel, I really like this carousel, oh baby, carousel, your love is like a carousel, your love is like a carousel, I really like this carousel. Boogie now, uh, I'ma say it one more time, I'm not gonna stop, yeah, yeah, I'ma say it one more time, I'm not gonna stop, yeah, yeah. And then we have a new record label called V Records and a new TV channel called VTV, where some new video blogs are being produced right now. So it's very new. Mm -hmm. uh, the website for V Media Entertainment or vmedia.com is the website just went online at the end of January. Even though could be timid, could be shy, tell it like it is, cause it's music or die. At VME, we just believe in thinking differently. And what I mean by that is we are inclusive. We are challenging societal norms by redefining what it means to be different and popular, different and hot different and sexy. We pride ourselves on being a space where creators can tell their stories honestly. I believe in being an interruption, stopping the process, stopping the cycle, interrupting good to get to great. Man, when that happens, greatness occurs. And I am, my official title now is the Director of Catalog and Licensing, which means I'm the person in charge of attempting to get songs placed in TV, movie, and movies and video games and so forth. I also worked on a video game last year that's coming out later this year called Rhythm Rumble, which I produced. Oh. And um, there's a song, a title track on that, that my son wrote and sang. And he goes by the name of Max Milley, and that's spelled M-V-X-M-I-L-L-I, -L -L Max hmm. Milley. You can catch him on we, we will. iTunes, anywhere, you know, and he, he's an up and coming artist himself and producer. He's 25 now and wow. lives out in Los Angeles. And But uh, now, Matt, could you maybe send us some, uh, if there's some art, you mentioned the record label. Sure, I'll send links to all your stuff, all, everything. And uh, if there's some uh, upcoming, yeah, you mentioned your son, but also if there are other artists that, that you like to promote because uh, i'll send everything in fact i just worked on a, a song the other day for a, a group out of the san francisco area called funk shui wow and i they, love that name i love that name great name <laughs> and, and they're friends of mine these guys yeah. and they and i've worked with some of those musicians in the past but they not all of them but they embody the minneapolis sound so wow. well so well 
funk, the funk side of it. They, they're like a cross yeah. between the time meets Jesse Johnson meets Jelly Bean meets uh, some like Cameo or any of these guys, you know, wow. that were the, the 80s funk heroes. That so sounds I, amazing. I'll links to everything and, and it'll be a lot of fun. So, you have to send us those links. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tim, is there some uh, questions that we feel forgot or some topics that you want to touch upon that we haven't mentioned yet? Not really. I think we, we covered quite a bit. Uh, other than, you know, check out V Media, check out the artists on the website. Mm. There are, you know, five or six now, I think, signed artists on there being featured. Wow. And um, it's very exciting time. Feels just like last week I was asking for your name There's no mistaking in between us was a flame And I'm so reeling from the suddenness of some things that I forgot how to feel And all these girls tore me down to this that I, I forgot that love is real It's been a great honor to talk to you, and it's been uh, it's been very nice to see you in the last couple of years when we met. And uh, I hope everything turns out good, and that we will see the revolution again sometimes. That's my uh, hope. Yeah, I, I hope so too. So it was, yeah, I just agree. It's been a pleasure, and it was, I guess, two years ago we met last time in Copenhagen. I, I guess it was sure. your birthday that day, and I, yeah. I thought I brought, I brought you some cake actually, if you remember. <laughs> yes, I, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> the purple appreciate cake. That. <laughs> yeah. So uh, take care and hopefully this COVID will get over and we will see you over here in uh, Europe soon. But uh, let's we let's stay will. in touch and we will do our very best to promote your new projects in the European forums here and different kinds. So just Absolutely. send us whatever you want to do and we I will. I will. we support.
What's up? It's the Philharmonic coming to you live for the next episode of Say What Podcast. Stay tuned. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and our homepage for the latest news. You got